So good evening. Uh, welcome to our Wednesday night this week Bible study. Uh, you guys doing all right? Yeah, everything well? Man, I really hope it's well uh, for you. You guys been enjoying the rain? I'm sure you have, man. I mean, that's a bunch of rain. Um, so hopefully you're all, everything is good as can be. Let's put it that way. Um, so we're going to be sending out in the mail um, at the end of the week uh, an outline uh, discussing how we're going to reconvene our, our Sunday morning gatherings and what that will look like. Um, but as of, as of today, um, our plan is to reconvene the first Sunday in June. Uh, so I'm pretty sure that's June the 7th, but the first Sunday in June, so about two Sundays away from now. Um, and, and in short, and we'll discuss all of this in the meeting there, is uh, it's only going to be our Sunday morning gathering. Now, so we're not going to be reconvening our Sunday school just yet. Uh, we're not going to be reconvening our Sunday nights or our Wednesday nights. Uh, and in fact, we're not even going to be reconvening um, the things that we do with our children, like our children's programs uh, there. We're still going to continue everything online. And I, I really appreciate the patience that you gave us last week as we're trying to do Vimeo and YouTube uh, for a while. But just, just, just rest assured, we're going to keep YouTube until we get all the kinks with Vimeo uh, worked out. So we're continuing our Bible study uh, tonight. And we've decided to supplement our study of the Red Sea and that story of Israel coming out of slavery in Egypt, um, passing through the Red Sea and going off to the mountain to receive the commandments of God with this book right here by Robert J. Morgan called Red Sea Rules. Uh, we still got a couple copies left um, if you haven't got yours. And it's, it's a pretty short book, as you can see. I mean, it's not very thick. Uh, so if you've not had a chance yet to get yours, you, you can be able to catch up as we're only on chapter, chapter 2. Uh, Do you guys like chapter 2? Yeah, I really enjoyed uh, chapter 2, and it was entitled, Be More Concerned for God's Glory Than for Your Relief. So once again, the title was, Be More Concerned with God's Glory Than for Your Relief. Now, when I first read that, I'm like, what? Seriously? Like, that's a bold statement, you know, because we're not really used to hearing stuff like that, are we? For a lot of us, we kind of tend to think that God is there to, you know, to make our life easy. I mean, doesn't Jesus say uh, that his yoke and his burden are going to be light? I mean, isn't God supposed to knock down every barrier that's in our path? Uh, so we've almost convinced ourselves that that's what God does in our lives, just makes an easy path, you know, almost kind of like the helicopter parent that's not going to let anything bad happen to us. And then this Robert J. Morgan guy comes on and he's bold enough to entitle chapter number two. You know, so he gives you a hook right out of the, out of the gate. Be more concerned with God's glory rather than your relief. And you know, the more I think about that, I, I think, man, he, he's got it right. Like, that's a really good way to think about it. Because oftentimes, I mean, remember back to that last time when you were in a really difficult situation, or maybe you find yourself in a really difficult situation. Now, what are some of the questions that we typically ask ourselves? And he points this out in the chapter but he said oftentimes our questions when we find ourselves in a difficult spot go something like this, like how, how can we get out of this situation more quickly, you know, or quicker, you might say, or as quick as possible. Like how can we minimize the difficulty that this situation is bringing into my life? How can I minimize the pain? We may even ask the question, like why is this happening and, and when is God going to do something about it? Like now, you know, like yesterday is when he should have been acting. And, but I think, I think maybe the better question to ask is just what, you know, Robert J. Morgan suggested. How can I glorify God in this situation? Now, now we have to remember that the word question um, comes down to us from the Latin, which means quest. So if you have quest, shion, that shion on the end there, that T-I-O-N, that means the act, right? So I-O-N is the act. So it's the act of questing. So what a question will do, whether we know this or not, a question will send us down a path, right? It'll send us a, down a, a journey, you might say, during, it'll send you a way, a path. I don't know why I stumbled over that words, man. I, who knows, man? Maybe it's because I've been talking into cameras too long. Anyways, I'm glad you're here. It's good to see you. Um, so think about the two different, how these two different questions may work. Right? Question number one says, why is this thing happening and how can I get out of this? Now that will send you down a very different path than question number two, which is how can I glorify God in this situation? Right? I mean, those really aren't just two silly questions when you think about it. 
Those two questions, how can I get out of this or how can I glorify God in this, will send you down two very different paths. They will set you on two different trajectories. That was the word I was looking for earlier, but I couldn't find. Right? They will place two different goals for you. They will give you two different ways to gauge success. I mean, how I get out of this, well, success is getting out of it. How can I determine God? Success may, or glorify God. Success may not be getting out of it, but maybe glorifying God. So we got to be aware of the questions that we're asking ourselves. And I'm really glad that, that he pointed out in the book that maybe the question that I need to, and maybe you're already asking this question, but I know for me, the question that I need to ask more often is how can I glorify God in this moment? How can I glorify God in this circumstance? How can I glorify God under these circumstances? Now, in order to answer that question, I mean, it's easy enough to ask the question, right? But in order to begin to answer it, the first thing we have to look at is, well, what does it mean to glorify God? I mean, because that's kind of a churchy word that we don't use um, anymore. Now, we've talked a little bit about this before. So for some of you, it'll be review and for others, it'll be new. But either way, it's always good, whether it's new or review and it rhymes. So you're welcome for that. So what is glory? Uh, Well, the Hebrew word for glory is actually the word kavod. Um, So you may heard some pronounce it kabod, but I I like kabod because when I hear kabod, I think of kabod attractors, um, and that's just confusing right off the bat. So kabod. Now, kabod is is kind of a super cool word um, in the Bible, or at least I think it's super cool to say, but but it's really used in in two main ways in the scriptures. Um, The first way that that word kabod um, is used is it's, it's kind of describing um, or, or it's a visible display of someone's splendor or someone's status. So, so I like to think of your kavod or your glory as your bling. Um, so I was disappointed that the, Olympian, the Olympics weren't able to happen uh, this summer, but I got thinking about your glory and kavod. And, and when the Olympian, when they stand up on that podium and they place that gold medal around their neck, that, that's, that's their glory, in a sense, right? That little piece of gold, that little piece of bling is a visible way to let the entire world know about this person's power, about their status, about their hard work, about their victory. So it's something that points past itself um, in that regard. Now, now we do this with all kinds of things. We have all different ways in which we try to demonstrate um, visibly our glory or our power or our hard work or our status, whatever it is. Um, so if, you, if you're a student of history, people used to do this with those little powdered wigs, man. Um, so there's a picture. Isn't that such a hysterical picture that men would dress up like that? You'd be mocked today. Um, but at the time, that was a display of your power, of your prestige, of your honor, and of your wisdom. We do this with things like our cars. You know, our cars demonstrate um, who we are or our success or what we find to be beautiful or what we find to be powerful, et cetera, et cetera. We do this with our, our houses, you know, or castles, you might say, um, in that. These are all visible ways of displaying something about who we are and what we stand for. We do it with our clothing. You know, so cowboys, man, they have a very particular uh, glory that they wear. Isn't that funny? I think I've shown that picture before, but it's good. Um, We do it with our religious outfits. Um, That's just the way it is, man. Like our uniforms, you know. I mean, the police have uniforms. The army has uniforms. The Pope, he's got uniforms and, and big hats. And even animals themselves, uh, they, they, they do this, right? So all those pictures would be ways to think about glory, that glory, in a sense, is, our, is a visible way to display who we are, our character, our beauty, our status, you know, what we're about. So, for example, in the scripture, um, David will talk about how God's kavod or God's um, glory is in the heavens. Notice what Psalm 19 says. It says, the heavens declare the glory or the kavod of God. So I I always like to think about the galaxies or the stars, you know what I mean, or the heavens as God's cosmic bling. You know, it's like the gold medal that, you know, he's, he's not wearing in a sense, but, you know, it's his gold medal that demonstrates his power. It demonstrates his creativity. It demonstrates his beauty, his order, and his, his wisdom. Uh, Think about it like this, you know, we, we build things that last for, you know, a few years now. I mean, it seems like things 
used to last longer than what they do um, nowadays. But, but when God built his universe, I mean, it's lasted thousands or, or uh, by some calculations, millions of years. Um, and it's still working. I mean, it runs like clockwork. In fact, we set our watches um, by it. So that's one way in which glory is used. It's a visible display of, of who you are, right? Or what makes you important in that regard. The second way uh, that word kavod or glory is used in the scriptures um, is it's to describe someone's reputation or someone's character or someone's street cred. So, so your glory is like that. You know, it's, your, it, it's what goes ahead of you. It's, it's your reputation. It kind of precedes you where you go. And if you think about how your reputation works, oftentimes people will hear about your reputation before they actually meet you. So what they experience is your glory, your reputation, your street cred first before they ever get to know you. And that's why you want your reputation to be good, right? You want your glory, that which goes out into the world, the story about you, to actually represent who you really are. So God's glory goes out, and we'll get to how this works, uh, but it, it needs to represent who he actually is. Because we've all met the person who their reputation didn't line up with who they actually were. They were very different than the story um, that went out about them, you might say. Now, in the scriptures, um, God's glory is given to you and I, to his image bearers, to, to people. So, so if you think about it like this, I like this, this board some more. All right, so you got God, and we'll just, you know, stick him up there. Then you got his image bearers, man. All right, so you got man with his beard, right, and woman. Right? And they are to reflect God. So God's reputation is to be taken out into the world through humanity, through His image bearers. And remember what we said, right? oftentimes people will come in contact with the reputation before the actual person. So what we want then is we want people, when they come in contact with us, Right? That do they get the correct representation of who God actually is? We don't want to misrepresent um, the character, the nature of God. In fact, um, that's the commandment. Do not carry the Lord's name in vain. Um, that's really not a commandment about cussing. Now, sure, you probably shouldn't cuss. Um, but, but, this about, but carrying the Lord's name in vain means we're misrepresenting the name of God that we're, in a sense, spitting upon his reputation or we're making it something that he is, he is not. Uh, so notice how this works in Psalm chapter 8. In Psalm chapter 8, we get this beautiful um, image of what humanity is supposed to be. Notice how the psalm begins. It says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Remember, we've talked about that. The heavens, man, that's God's cosmic bling. But notice how he continues. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him? And the son of man that you care for him. And you've, we've all been there, right? You've all been outside like staring up into the night sky and you're, you realize that the galaxy is so massive, man, the universe, that we've not even found the end of it. And here we are on this tiny little floating space rock, just one of eight billion some odd people. How insignificant we really are. And yet God thinks of us and finds us important. Notice what he said. He says, you have made him, that's man and woman, you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. And you have crowned him with glory and honor. Now remember, crown is a sign of rule. And, and what's a ruler? We don't use the word ruler anymore, but a ruler is someone who manages something, whether it be a land or a business or a family or whatever, right? So rule is you're an important person who manages. And notice the psalm continues. It says, you have crowned him with glory and honor and you have given him dominion over the works of your hands and you have put all things under his feet. So do you see this here? 
that God has designed in His wisdom humanity, and humanity is going to be crowned. Okay, we'll give them a nice red crown. Oh, that's beautiful, man. Look at that. Talk about some kavod there, man. Right? They've been crowned with what? Glory and honor. And this glory and this honor is demonstrated in the fact that they are to have dominion or rule over the works of God's, the work of God's hands. So what's the aim? What's the goal? What's the end of human life? Well, according to the Scriptures, the goal is actually to glorify God. And this is what we are crowned with. And this is our task. This is our mission given to us. That we have been crowned with the glory and we've been given rule. And that, that our reputation, our reputation is supposed to come through how we manage life. So how we manage our churches how we manage our businesses, how we manage our marriages, how we manage our families, you know what I mean, how we manage all these things. And this management not only speaks to our reputation, but it's to reflect and to speak to who? God's reputation. Right? And why were we given this in the first place? Well, because who's the capital R ruler of everything? Well, God is. And if God is the capital R ruler then His images, or the people who are going to represent Him, to re-show Him to the world, also need to be managers or rulers. So the biblical understanding of what it means to be a human, as silly as those little drawings are, um, but the biblical understanding of humanity is that we were designed to represent. Okay, so you got the idea of represent, re Represents, man. So to, again, show. So we were designed to show again God by what? By ruling or how we steward our lives, our businesses, our families, our churches. And that in doing so, people should learn something about the nature, wisdom, beauty, creativity, forgiveness, justice, and mercy of God. Now, if you don't like the word represent, uh, the represent by ruling, the biblical word would be the royal priesthood. The royal priesthood. So in the Scriptures, you have, um, you have a hierarchy. So you have God, then you've got His representatives, which would be, you know, man and woman. Man and... Whoa, man. <laughs> Oh, that's funny, right? You heard that joke? Why did Adam call Eve woman? Because when he saw her, he's like, whoa, man, right? That's a good one, isn't it? And then you have creation. Okay, now I know a lot of us don't like hierarchies anymore, uh, but the Bible is perfectly fine with them. In all of God's uh, creation, there's, there's hierarchy. So you've got royal priesthood. So you've got God, you've got humanity, man and woman, and you've got creation. So, royal priesthood. So, what's a priest? Well, the word priest just means bridge, right? So, man is supposed to be a bridge between God, you know what I mean, and, and creation. And royal means that man is ruling. They don't rule over God. God rules over them. But they, as God's image, rule over the creation itself and, and to manage. So, when we are properly stewarding, right, or managing or making something of God's creation, of God's world in a way that reflects or represents or demonstrates the wisdom, the justice, the generosity, and the love of the God, we are in that moment being fully human and we are living out what we were created for. Um, In fact, as odd as this seems, when Jesus talks about eternal life, um, he doesn't necessarily talk about it in reference of it lasting forever. Now, it's true, right? Eternal life will last forever because you're with God. And if you're with God, God doesn't die. And He gives you the gift um, of immortality. It's actually sin, right, is what takes us away um, from that. But notice this how Jesus talks about eternal life. It comes to us from the book of John. And it says this. It says, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you, since you have given Him all authority over flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given to Him. So notice the connection 
of glory and authority or rule. And now Jesus puts eternal life in there as well. So we've got glory, rule, and eternal life. Notice what he says now in verse 3. He says, and this is, this is, this is eternal life. You want to know what eternal life is? This is what Jesus says it is. That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the works that you gave me to do. Do you see that? For Jesus, eternal life consists of, of two things. Now, yes, it means to live forever. Okay, we all get that. But for Jesus, it consists mainly of two things. Knowing God and glorifying Him. Knowing God and glorifying Him. What is eternal life? Knowing God and glorifying Him. And that's why eternal life can begin now. Eternal life for the Christian starts at your conversion. When we come up out of the waters of baptism, eternal life begins. Why? Because we know the Father and our, our life is a new mission to glorify Him. And it's also true that our life will not go out of existence either. And this is what Jesus came to bring. He came to bring revelation about who God is so that we could know Him. And Jesus came to heal us and to save us so that we, being made new in spirit, and ultimately one day new in body, will be able to fully glorify God. I really enjoy what the first uh, catechism... and remember, We don't do catechisms anymore because it sounds too... Catholic or traditional or anything like that. We almost don't like them. The word itself, ah. Uh, but the word catechism, catecheo, just means question and answer. Remember how we talked about how important questions were? So the very first catechism um, in the Westminster Confession uh, says, what is the chief end of mankind? Or to phrase it another way, what's, what's the goal of life, you know? Right? If you were asking in modern English, you might say, what's life all about? child or adult or Jason, what's life all about? Or, vice, or, or, or on the side of that, how do you know when you've made it, right? Because we all want to quote unquote make it. So how do I know that I've got there? And then the answer is to that is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. I like that. What's the point of, what's the point of human life, you know? Well, to glorify God and to enjoy Him in the process. Uh, compare that with Mark Twain who made a mockery of that statement, and when they asked him, what's life all about? He said, to get rich, dishonestly if you can, and honestly if you must. So what's the goal? What's the goal of life? This is a good question to ask yourself. What's the goal of your life, personally? But if you say, you know, I think I want to be concerned more concerned with God's glory than with my own relief. If I really want to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, if I say, you know, that's what life is supposed to be about. Well, what does it mean to glorify? We, we know what glory is. So let's, let's think back here. If, if glory is kind of your street cred, if it's a demonstration of your reputation, of your accomplishments, of your, of your power then to glorify would be to showcase those accomplishments, those, you know, your rep, that reputation, to somehow reflect it or even, even to speak about it or to live out it. So, so if your glory is your hair, <laughs> right, if that's your glory, if that really speaks to who you are, your sweet hairdo, um, then for me to glorify you would be to brag about your hair, Right? Or to point other people to how awesome your hair is. Um, and the, the, the best way to glorify it would be for me to get the same haircut. You know, that would really say something about how wonderful your hair is. So let, let's think about some of the accomplishments of God. Some of God's glory. What are some of His accomplishments that we think about down through the Scriptures? Well, you read on page 1 that He brings light into darkness. You know? We read about how He forgives sins. This is accomplishments of God. He feeds, you know, the hungry, hungry animals and hungry people. He clothes the naked. I mean, we see this right all the way back in Genesis chapter 3. He, he executes justice 
for the poor and for those taken advantage of, for the weak, right? He praises the humble. He exalts the lowly. He heals the sick. He casts out demons. He slays dragons. He remains faithful. He's slow to anger. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on and on. So these are just some of the things, some of the the reputation or character of who God is. So if you or I decide, okay, I want to be more concerned about God's glory rather than relief, then the question is me is, okay, how can I let the world know? Or how can I demonstrate or how can I brag about right, these characteristics of God in my life? Well, think about it. If God, if one of the things that God does is He forgives sins, and I want to point to the glory of God, then when I forgive someone who's wronged me, I have spread the reputation of God's character throughout the world, and therefore, I have glorified Him. If God is a God of patience, and I'm to represent Him to the world, then when I patiently persist, I have done what? I've spread the reputation of God throughout the world. If God is a God we are told slow to anger, this is just who He is, then when I'm slow to anger, whether it be in the church, in my business, in my marriage, in my family, I'm spreading the, repu- the reputation, right? I'm representing the characteristic of God to the world. When I'm humble, when I remain faithful, when I build people up instead of tearing them down, I'm spreading the fame or the glory or the character of God out into the world and thus I am glorifying Him. And we can do this in all aspects of our lives. And oftentimes, people will run into us before they run into God. Right? I mean, that's a high calling. And I've not done a good job with it. And it's a huge responsibility. And there's been a lot of times in my life I haven't taken it seriously. Um, But with Christ, all things are possible, you know. And each day is a new opportunity to glorify God. So I got thinking about this in the light of Jesus. Because Jesus is the true image, right? He's the true image. He's the perfect image of God. He was the one that demonstrated to us what glorifying God looks like. And Jesus was all about it, wasn't he? He was all about making God's power and God's wisdom and God's forgiveness and God's mercy and God's creativity and God's beauty. He was all about making that known to the world, whether it be through how he interacted with people, whether it be through how he taught, whether it be through the miracles that he performed. He wanted the world to know what God was like. And what I find interesting about that is that Jesus, the main way um, that he chose to reveal The glory of God. So the main way Jesus chose to glorify God, to let the world know what God is like, was during the time of His greatest suffering, was on the cross. Notice what He says in John chapter 12. He says, Now my soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Isn't that good? Isn't that so good, man? What's the title of this chapter again? To be more concerned with God's glory than with your relief. And what do we see Jesus doing? Being more concerned with God's glory. Showing the world who God is like than with his own relief. Notice what he says next. Father, glorify your name. Now, this should be very, very encouraging to all of us. Because notice how Jesus made known to the world God's power, God's beauty, God's justice, God's forgiveness, God's generosity, God's character. He made it known to the world in the most profound of ways on the cross. That He taught us more about God when he was suffering than when he was healthy. Keep this in mind. Jesus taught us more about God when he was suffering than when he was healthy. 
Now, he taught us a lot about God when he was healthy. But he taught us the most about God in his suffering. And on the cross, we learned that God is the one who will heal the world. That on the cross, we learn, we see that God is a God who will go through the fire of hell itself to save his people if we allow him to save us. I, I like one of the quotes that I found in the book in chapter 2. And the quote said this. I, I should have had it on the screen, but I, I don't. So you just have to listen. It says, The sorest afflictions never appear intolerable except when we see them in the wrong light. The sorest afflictions never appear intolerable except when we see them in the wrong light. And for some of us, we think that we've bought into the lie that when we were young, when we were healthy, when we were able to build things like church buildings, that's when we really glorified God. And Jesus seems to just smash that thinking. That he glorified God most when he was suffering. And you say, okay, well, how can I glorify God when I'm suffering? Um, so the other day, uh, my son, uh, I won't mention which one, had a splinter in his foot. Uh, and it was pretty deep, and it was going to require uh, some digging, you might say, uh, to get it out. Um, so my wife, Ashley, she goes and she gets a needle. Uh, now think about this, right? I try to put myself in my son's shoes, because uh, needles hurt, right? I mean, they hurt. There's a reason we do not like them. So, so, so imagine this. Imagine what's going through my son's mind. He has a pain in his foot. And this pain in his foot is making his life miserable. So he goes to the person who loves him, which is his mother, thinking that my mother, who loves me and doesn't want me to suffer, will fix my pain. So this is what he does. He goes to mother to fix pain. And her solution to fixing my pain is to get out a needle. And this is how she intends to heal him. And remember, a needle which can cause me more pain and more hurt. And her plan, my, this mother who loves me, is to shove the needle into my foot where the pain is. At the same time, she is telling me, just trust me, this is what's best for you. And just put yourself in that little kid's shoes again. Like, seriously, Mom? You want me to trust your plan? That makes sense. That makes sense, you know what I mean, to my childish mind. Let's stick a pain-causing agent into the foot that's already hurting with pain. And somehow this added pain, which you're going to put on top of me, is supposed to ease the other pain. Why would you want to hurt me, mother? The sorest of afflictions, man, that quote got to me. The sorest of afflictions never appear intolerable except when we see them in the wrong light. Except when we see them in the wrong light. My, my wife, Ashley, um, if, you, if you know her, she would die for any one of her children. No questions asked. No questions asked. She would walk through the fire of hell if it, would, um, if it were possible. If it would save them, she would do it. There would be no link to which she would travel to rescue or save or heal her children. And I'm sure it's the same with you and your children. So, so how, how could my son glorify his mother? How could he make known the character of his mother to the world? in the middle of this suffering, and by the world would be just a little group of people who's there. How could he do that? Well, I'm sure he could build, a, you know what I mean, a cathedral to her name, right? Sure, he could write letters. He could tat, you know what I mean, mom on his arm. But what's the best way uh, that he could glorify his mother in the middle of this suffering? By simply trusting that she knows best, Right? What better way to demonstrate her character, the character that would go to hell and back to rescue him if possible, than by trusting her 
in this moment. In this moment where he doesn't understand why she is leading him into this situation. What better way to demonstrate the love right, that she has for him than by remaining calm and trusting that maybe, just maybe, she not only knows what she's doing, but she has his best interest in mind. That yes, it will be painful, but the pain is not punishment. The pain is not just anger, but it's part of the plan, and that this plan is the best plan. What better way to glorify his mother, to let the world know who she is, than in this situation just trusting that she knows best? So how can you glorify God when you are suffering? I think the answer is by trusting him and by simply doing what he asked you to do. And what has he asked us to do? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Did I count those wrong? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So here's Jesus on the cross. Let's go back to Christ because he's the perfect image of God. He's the one who fully glorified the Father. And what's Jesus doing on the cross? He's simply obeying and simply what? Trusting. That's what the song, trust and obey for there's no other way. And what I find interesting is that every single one of those fruits of the Spirit was on full display on the cross. And some of us, we bought into the lie that because of our age, because of our health, because of all the things that we can't do anymore, we can't glorify God. Think about Christ. He could do nothing. He was nailed to a tree. He was unable to move. He couldn't go anywhere. He was unable to mow his yard. He was unable to run a marathon. He couldn't use his legs. He couldn't use his arms. His throat was parched. He could barely speak. He was having a hard time breathing. But there, in that moment... He fully glorified God in a way that no one else ever has. Because on the cross, of all the things that he couldn't do, he did the things he was asked to do. He loved. He loved. He saw the joy that was set before him. He offered peace. He remained patient. He was kind. He was good. He remained gentle even with his speech. He stayed faithful to God. And he exhibited self-control. Christ glorified God on the cross. And the same God who led him in is the same God who led him out three days later. So I think it's a good question to ask ourselves. When we're struggling, when we find ourselves in a situation where we don't know what to do, when we're frustrated about the, all the things that we can't do, instead of asking, God, when are you going to fix this mess? Let's ask the question, okay, how can I glorify God now? How can I glorify God in these circumstances? How can I let the whole world know who Christ is? How can I love? How can I see the joy in this? How can I offer peace or reconciliation? How, how can I remain patient? How can I be kind to someone or to myself? How can I be good? How, how can I remain gentle? 
How can I stay faithful? And how can I exhibit self-control? And the same God who allowed me to be led here will be the same God who leads me out. Amen. You guys have a wonderful night.